I now want to uh, hand over to uh, Professor Chris Dowson. Uh, as I said, Chris um, was there at the first annual general meeting. He was at meetings prior to the formation of this charity. He's a professor of microbiology at the University of Warwick, and he will introduce our keynote lecture this afternoon. Chris. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Colin. Uh, well, this is worth travelling to London for to introduce Kevin Newsom. Uh, so, it's, uh, it's a real highlight. Uh, Kevin is a professor of law at Boston University and has got a long and distinguished uh, publication career. Uh, 2004, when he started talking about drug reimbursement and pricing, and then moving on to thinking about counterfeit drugs. I think that might, I don't know, this might have really opened up your eyes to where antibiotics fit into all of this and then just accelerated you know, exponentially and is now really influential, uh, increasingly so, in trying to help shape. Scientific and government opinion on how we can try to tackle uh, AMR from uh, not just a fundamental business perspective but also practically. So, 2016, Carbex came along, two years after our charity uh, was started, I think 2016, July. Obviously, that was a game changer. It really was a wake up call that actually something was going to happen here because we were meeting in small hotels in York, you know, and thinking there's no money in this, no one's interested in this. How does this work? That was an enormous encouragement to us. And uh, it's just a real pleasure to, to have you and to hear more about what you're doing. So, if you notice, there's a silence right now next door, right? And, and if you're listening a few minutes ago, there wasn't silence. You, you, you know what was out there? All, all of these uh, youthful energy. I mean, if we could make a pill out, out of the energy from those kids next door at the school. Um, it would be wonderful for people my age uh, to have that. But I'm reminded of, I have uh, three grandchildren, and uh, one of them is about the age of some of the younger students out there, and she makes a lot of noise in the playground. She has a grand time. But um, her first few days of life were touch and go, and she had a bacterial uh, infection associated with the way that she was born and uh, difficulties breathing uh, for the first few days. And uh, the antibiotics that were given uh, prevented her uh, from dying. Uh, it'll never show up on a, you know, register, you know, that, that uh, her life was saved. Um, we don't spend a lot of time reminding her of that. <laughs> you, know, you know, you almost died, right, of a bacterial... No, we, I don't do that. But uh, there's countless people for whom their life is actually owed to the existence of this class of drugs. And uh, I just... Couldn't start listening to that noise without being reminded that my granddaughter, but perhaps others out there, uh, they owe their life at this moment uh, to what happened. I want to say something before I get into my talk about the small grants program that you have. Um, I received my first grant in antibacterials when I had written almost nothing, had no reason to, to know anything about this, uh, but... I applied to the David Saul Smith Foundation and got a $10,000 grant to, to write my first article in this area. And, uh, and I thought it was the grandest thing ever and, and it allowed me to focus. And, and uh, today, you know, Carbex has received over $500 million to work on uh, drug development in this space as a charity, as a, as a nonprofit enterprise. And it started with a very small beginning. So this, the seed grants can be really powerful. So imagine that we're in a, uh, an action movie, uh, and, and uh, a building is on fire, and somebody says, let's run in there and, 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 and you know, save people, right? You know, the first question is, needs to be, what exactly are we doing? You know, what is the plan, right? Uh, who are we trying to save, right? And, uh, and so I want to focus first on who we're trying to save in this entire endeavor, right? Oh, obviously... Uh, we're trying to save my granddaughter and other children, you know, like that. But but what is the what is the actual thing? We're trying to save what I think is the most important drug class in human history, the most important pharmaceuticals or drugs in history, the things that have been more impactful on human health than anything from the beginning of of the industry to today, are antibiotics. Um, we call this in the law and economics literature uh, the enablement value. But uh, the number two cause of death for people with cancer is infection. 
Uh, everyone who has a cancer treatment that renders their immune system weakened needs the safety net of antibiotics, also antifungals, to prevent you know, something uh, happening to them. It doesn't do any good if you survive the cancer and die of infection. Uh, likewise, any sort of surgery, including uh, knee or hip replacement or, or cesarean section, uh, everything in modern medicine actually would be more dangerous, less useful, more risky, if it were not for the safety net of antibiotics. Antibiotics actually enable a lot of modern medicine. They actually enable a lot of civilization, as we've seen with COVID, uh, what happens to our ability to associate with each other in the presence of pandemic. Uh, antibiotics have done that for bacteria. Uh, I wish we had had something better prepared against viruses. But we have to remember when we're spending all of these billions of dollars fighting off viruses, the vast part of the tree of life, the things that want to eat us and kill us and take us, are bacteria. And we have to remember that we need to be prepared for them. So antibiotics, the most important drug class in human history, the biggest impact on human health. Uh, they enable modern medicine. They enable civilization or society as, as we think of it. Um, there's been four Nobel Prizes given to 12 you know, groups of individuals for, for things that are related to antibiotics. Uh, going back to 1939, but also Fleming in 45 and Wakesman in 52. And in 2009, a group of chemists who, who discovered the structure and function of the ribosome. And then in the, in the prize, it says, and now we have great targets for antibiotics on the ribosome. So this is really an amazing thing. Uh, and it's an amazing thing that we have somehow wasted, right? Um, most of antibiotics that we have today are really derived from natural products uh, in the sense that there was a billion years of evolutionary battle in the soil between fungi and bacteria and, and, and against each other. And, and they created through competitive evolution over a billion years things like penicillin. It was created by a mold, a fungi, in order to be able to, to carve out an ecological niche for itself. And, and we've taken those things that, that required a billion years of life on this planet to create, and we burned through them in a lifetime or two, in less than 100 years. We, we burned. So this would be like taking, I mean, how crazy would it be to take uh, you know hundreds of millions of years of of fossil fuels and, and to run through them quickly. Oh wait, we did that too. Right? <laughs> you know, did different problem. But uh, you know, we've done the same thing. This is not an infinite resource. Uh, this is you know potentially a finite resource. It's been created by the planet. It's a gift to us. We've not been careful with it, and we're trying to create other things that are synthetic antibiotics, but they're really hard. The natural products are still account for most of what we're doing. So what am I trying to say? That's what we're trying to say. The effectiveness of antibiotics, the availability of antibiotics, so that all of us can live a healthy, productive lives, uh, all of our families and people more remote from us, uh, you know, without the threat of being killed by bacteria. That's my goal. So why do these things need saving? You know, usually valuable things in a capitalist economy uh, don't need some charity to save them. You know, there should be a market for these things, right? So here's the problem. Uh, the COVID vaccine and every other vaccine, um, it actually benefits the world if everyone gets it. And I know this is a controversial and political topic in all of our countries. Uh, I, I have both of my vaccinations and all of us should. But uh, you know, it has a positive benefit in the language of law and economics, a positive externality. If we all take it, then none of us can get it. Herd immunity, I don't like that phrase because I don't feel like a member of a herd. You know, I, I, but the population, the people, us, civilization, the planet, we are protected if we all get it. So we want everyone to get the vaccine. The more we sell and the more we put in arms, the better. Antibiotics are the opposite. The more that we use them, the more that we drive resistance. The more that we use them, there's a negative externality. It's almost like pollution. We, we, we increase bacterial evolution. We make, we make the next antibiotic less effective. So we only want to use them when absolutely necessary. And the newest ones, we want to be especially careful with. 
and use them only in the patients for whom the existing drugs don't work. Okay. Um, that is called antibiotic stewardship. It is an excellent idea. It is exactly what the world needs. But from a company's perspective, you just said, listen, we're going to we're going to use every resource of government and society and, and set up charities and everything else. And, and our goal is to limit the sales of your product. Okay. Um, only uh, only cigarettes get away with still making a profit in that regime, and that's because they're addictive, right? Um, antibiotics, the, the excellent use of stewardship limits the market. We want to use it sparingly. And uh, for a company that only has 10 or 15 years left on its patent, uh, they can't afford to wait 10 or 15 years for the product to start selling because they'll be bankrupt in the interim. A part of our problem is that we pay uh, by the pill. You know, this system of, of paying by the pill for everything in pharmaceuticals, but including antibacterials, um, it really was the model. It is the model. It, it was, it's how the industry was built. Um, it, 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 you know, the pharmaceutical industry was built in antibiotics in many ways. Um, and um, we've destroyed, not the industry, but all of us collectively, we're all responsible. Uh, we didn't listen to uh, Fleming's Nobel banquet speech in which he said there's a moral obligation on us to be careful with these. It falls on us because because we we literally took these pearls of modern medicine and we literally followed the biblical phrase and gave them to the pigs, to the swine. Right? We took a, you know the last ditch antibiotic and literally fed it to pigs in China for cheaper pork. You know, colistin. And and surprise, we now have colistin resistance globally. Um, because we took the best thing we had, the product of a billion years of life on Earth, and, and we used it to get slightly cheaper chicken and pork. Okay. Um, shame on us. <laughs> so, um, one day I was at my office many years ago when my oldest daughter was just a baby, very young, still, still at home with, with her mother, uh, nursing, you know, infant. And, and I get a phone, uh, a call at the, at the law firm. I was working in Chicago at the time. And, and the call was from a neighbor. This is pre-cell phone, you know, pre-internet, okay? And uh, that's how old I am. The, and uh, the neighbor said, Kevin, get home. Your house is on fire, okay? Um, so I, I ran out of the law firm. I, I hailed a cab and I said, drive as fast as you can. Here's my address. Um, and my house is on fire. If, uh, if you get a ticket for speeding, I'll pay it, right? And, and listen, you don't have to encourage a Chicago taxi driver very much to drive fast. But with that, boom, you know, it, it really, you really set a land speed record for getting. So I get to my house, and, and you can't get close because there's fire trucks everywhere and hoses across the street. So I get out, I pay the guy, and I run up, and, and there's my wife and daughter standing on the street. And our house is, the roof is still smoldering, but the house next door where the fire started is a total loss. And, uh, and we had some damage, but not serious damage. Um, the fire department, or fire brigade here, uh, saved my house, and possibly also my wife and daughter, because they were upstairs and didn't know what was going on. Uh, they knew what was going on when, when the men with axes were pounding on her, our front door to get them out. Uh, so they, they saved my house. They may well have also saved injury or death to my wife and, and young daughter. And, uh, and that was not the moment for me showing up there, for me to say um, something like, oh, there's a fire. This would be a good moment to think about designing fire trucks or to begin to think about um, you know, training individuals who are good at fire you know, prevention and, and firefighting and, and, to, and, to, and to plan to build a building in which this equipment and these people would stay and, and an entire system in which we could call them and they would show up at the place. And when they showed up, there's pipes in the ground that come out uh, that you can attach large hoses to and put out fires, right? You know, the planning that went into it before the fire broke at my house is the only reason why the house is still there and, and that my wife and daughter are safe. It was preparedness. It was planning. Chicago had burned in a great fire. It had fires here in London, too, over the centuries. And preventing that fire and being able to stop it from spreading to the whole neighborhood is the whole purpose of that investment. But we do not look at antibiotics that way yet. We are still paying for antibiotics on a per-fire basis. 
without preparing for the future. You're still paying for a pill. It would be like I show up at the, at the at afterwards, and that's the moment I would pay the fire department for having shown up at my house. You know, no money ever in the future, in the, you know, before, but they they, de they would depend entirely on on cash, money, uh, or a credit card, and after they put out the fire, or even worse, they would show up and then wait to be paid before they put out the fire. Okay, but that's what we're asking from from antibiotics today. You're not going to get paid until the fire, until the patient is dying in front of you. And, and, and that eliminates any sort of planning or preparedness or being ready, you know, which is what we need in this space. It's really hard for the companies to know exactly when um, we're going to need a particular antibiotic because bacterial evolution is, is in a certain direction. It's getting worse, but it's not easy to predict exactly when a certain disease is going to be endemic across or pandemic across the population. You know, I was saying in, in, in the coffee before, if we knew for sure in, in November of 2019 that we were going to be hit by COVID, then a vaccine in November of 2019 would have been worth billions of dollars, a vaccine against COVID, or a treatment that stopped it in its tracks, billions of dollars. What was the actual market value for such thing in November of 19? Zero, right? Zero. If we had had a way to have one ready, prepared for such a thing, we could have avoided a lot of what we're suffering. And, and some of the efforts now on pandemic preparedness against viruses around the world is to be ready for the next one, because we weren't ready for this one. And you have to pay for that in advance. You have to pay for that in a different way. It can't be after the virus hits. It can't be for us after the bacteria hits. So the result has been a drought. Um, the last time we had a new drug class against the worst superbugs, the gram negative bacteria, a new class that got actually approved by the FDA or EMA, it was discovered in the year I was born, 1962. My entire lifetime, we have not had the discovery of a new gram-negative antibiotic class that actually resulted in an approved drug. Okay. That's a long time, right? Um, so that's a drought. That's because the economic incentives are gone. It's not because the science is bad. It's because the economic incentives are bad. Uh, we've had new antibiotics, but they're not new classes. The, the, there's been 18 in the last decade, uh, tracking every antibiotic that's been approved by either the FDA or Canada or Japan or Europe, 18. But even those 18 are not getting commercially launched. So there, many of them are approved in Europe, uh, but uh, the companies will maybe launch it only in the UK and Sweden, because Sweden has a special program, maybe Germany, but they're not launching it in other countries in Europe, even though it's already approved for Europe, because the small cost of trying to sell it in Italy or Greece is not worth it compared to the low sales today. We should be paying these companies something for having brought this good antibiotic, put it in the shelf, put it behind glass, use it very sparingly for a decade or two, save it for when we need it, but the company still needs to be paid today. They can't wait a decade. You know, the, the fire equipment and the ceiling here, I can assure you those companies were paid on the day it was installed. They're, you, they're not gonna wait and get paid on the day there's a fire in this room. <laughs> we're expecting the impossible out of the companies to bring something to prepare society and, and, and wait for an uncertain time a certain but uncertain time on when they're going to get paid. So the companies are, are not commercially launching. The drugs we're getting are not spectacular. Uh, the companies are going bankrupt. Uh, looking at those 18 drugs, the median uh, U.S. sales, most of them launched first in the U.S., largest market, uh, $16 million per year in the last year. Median, you know, out of, out of all of them. You total up all of the 18 drugs total in the last 12 months, $714 million for the sales collectively in the U.S. That's the entire class of on-patent antibiotics, less than kind of a, an okay single cancer drug, right? So no wonder you know, that uh, the companies flee this. They're not being paid for tomorrow. They're being paid for yesterday or the, the fire that's already lit instead of the fire we can prevent and whatnot. So how can we fix this? You know, Because I don't want this to be a depressing talk, right? 
Uh, people claim that you know economics is a dismal science, right? And uh, I work in the field of law and economics. I'm, I'm going to try to leave you with something happy at the end here. Uh, I think this is a, a test as to whether humans are, are good at civilization. Climate change is another such test. But uh, antibiotic resistance is one that I think is easier to solve than climate change within our grasp. And, and it's a test of whether we can work together to, to create something that's a global public good that helps the planet and be prepared for things. Because uh, no one is safe unless everyone is safe against viruses and bacteria. We, we know that after COVID. Um, thinking about solutions in the space, uh, the thing I lead, CarbX, uh, there's some one-page flyers up here. I'll, I'll leave them if you care afterwards. But um, CarbX is all about innovation. We're trying to create new novel classes. We're trying to get the first that we haven't seen in my entire lifetime. So innovation is great, but uh, if all you do is innovation and, and the drug gets on the market and you waste it, like we did penicillin, then, then, I, then I think it's a hollow victory. You know, we have to also care about stewardship. Um, and if we have a great innovative drug and it costs a million dollars a pill, and so people around the world who need it can't get it because they, they're in poorer countries, then, then that's a tragedy. Right? So you have to care about access, too. Um, maybe you, all you care about is access. You, know, you want everyone in the world to have easy access to antibiotics. It's a great idea, except if everyone has easy access to it, you've wasted it. You know, people will take it inappropriately. You know, it, it's going to reduce the value of the drug quickly. If everyone has easy access to it, then how are you reimbursing the companies? Are you really supporting or undermining innovation? And likewise, in stewardship, if that's what you care about, let's save this drug, put it behind glass, put it behind bars. How are people going to get access to it if, if you have to jump through so many hoops? Right? And, if, and if it never sells, or sells so rarely because you're being careful with it, how are the companies going to make money? So the, the problem here is that you have to solve all three of these things, access, innovation, and stewardship. You have to find a way to solve all three simultaneously. Um, you know, we have to you know, find a way to build this thing that fixes all three problems simultaneously. Focusing on one or even two of those things won't work. You have to focus on all three. So the happy news is that your government leads the world in exactly that solution. The, the program that, uh, that's being piloted in, in National Health England and in the UK uh, on a subscription plan for antibiotics is exactly what I've been describing. Um, it actually, you know, my academic work for the past more than a dozen years uh, has increasingly focused on this is the thing that we need. We need a way to pay for antibiotics based on their value to society, their preparedness value, the value for today and tomorrow, not based on the number of pills sold, not based on the, the fire that's burning today, but, but the value to society, the value to surgeries, the value to cancer. And it's hard to do that on a per pill basis, but... The United Kingdom government, through National Health England and NICE, um, have, have introduced this program. There's two drugs in it now, Cefedrocol and, and Avicaz, uh, two of the most innovative out of the 18 new ones that have come on. And they will pay a subscription. Some people call it a, a Netflix subscription because if, if the government uses none of this drug next year, and that would be great news. That means that infection prevention and control was perfect, and, and that would, that's the goal. Or if they use a lot of it because something horrible happened, the price to the government is the same, right? Um, and so the company is rewarded for the innovation. The company has no incentive to oversell it. No one has a financial incentive to use it inappropriately, but it's available, already paid for if you need it, right? This simultaneously solves for access, innovation, and stewardship. The UK, uh, there's a lot of people who have talked about ideas like this over, over the past five years. Your government is the only one that's actually done it. Right? And now through the G7 process um, with the presidency with the, with the UK, you're talking to other governments saying, wouldn't you like to try this too? Because while we're doing it, and it's a good thing, um, the UK doing this by themselves won't be enough uh, we need other governments to do it too, especially other wealthy governments, in order for 
you know, it actually to function as a global research and development incentive. I agree completely. Um, working with people in the United States to try to have a, a something that's similar in the U.S. called the Pasteur Act. It's, it's introduced in Congress, but I don't know if you follow U.S. politics closely. Uh, our Congress is not every day completely functional. So, some days, uh, they, they, you know, it's difficult to get things done, especially something that's wonky and science-driven and, and thinking about the future and preparedness. Uh, but it is making progress, but it's hard to get such things. And uh, your government should be congratulated for having gotten it done somehow and now asking other countries, other G7 countries, to follow suit. I think it's a terrific thing. It's not an idea. It's a, it's a reality here. And it needs to be a reality um, in other wealthy countries and really everywhere around the world. So this problem, you can think of the problem of antibiotic resistance as a problem of chemistry or microbiology, right, uh, or medicine, something like that. I think it's, it's a much broader problem. It's really a problem about us. You know, it's how people respond to these things. You know, the, the planet created these things, and we've burned through them in a couple generations. So it's not just a, a solution of chemistry or microbiology, uh, you know, it's all, or medicine. It's a solution that requires uh, lawyers. Sorry, I am a lawyer. Um, it requires economists, and, and we need to change human behavior and how we think about and respond to these things. We need to change the way that we pay for them, how we think about them, how we communicate that to the world. And I, and I have to say... Um, you know, Carvex is working on the research and development side, funding all of these preclinical trials, developing these drugs. But uh, what I think we really need is the part of what you do to educate the public, to, to activate patients, uh, to engage people who, who, are, who really don't know that their lives are being saved by the safety net. Um, that's the part that's really missing. You know, the, the, the human engagement, because we have to tell our stories, because if we don't tell our stories, people won't know, you know, what, what's being saved and, and what's not being saved here. So my encouragement to you is that um, it's, a, it's a terrific mess. It's wonderful science being ground into dust by terrible economics. Uh, your government, amazingly, somehow, miraculously, leads the world in, in a exceedingly clever solution that is actually being implemented. And we want other governments to follow suit. But what we need more of is the public to understand this, and for there to be a way and, and, a, and, a, and a forum for the public to share their stories, and for the engagement to be broader and deeper.